Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the 30th chapter of the great book of Jeremiah, He whom God launches forth. Verse, about the first four or five verses of this uh, particular chapter have to do with the restoring the Word of God, whereby it would keep. That means the book, restoring the book. And the remainder is restoring God's children. So we have a chapter here then that is on restoration. Chapter 30, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, this being the Lord's word, saying, verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book, and that's the book we're reading. And the book that where he chose this one even before the foundations of the world. And as a prophet, even while he was in the mother's womb, put this book in order. You can count on it. It's the word of God. Verse 3. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah. Notice the difference. House of Israel, house of Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And naturally, uh, I'm going to free them, and, and I'm going to restore them. And naturally, this um, being, what, what is the foundation of the Word of God? It is written, and it is a promise from your heavenly Father. Verse 4, And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. I, I know it may seem like I harp on this quite a bit, but you've got to recognize the house of Israel and the house of Judah are separate here. And we're just coming up almost to the time of restoration, which means the end. They do not become one stick again until the end. They're two separate entities. And you, you must know that to understand the Word of God. It's, it's very, very important. What applies to one? In other words, this book of Jeremiah was written to the tribe of Judah, the house of Judah. The book of Isaiah was written to the house of Israel. Well, does it apply to both? Well, they're all brothers. But still, God has separate plans. Verse 5. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. This, this would have been back at this time from the Medes and the Persians, okay, which is Iran today. Uh, and we're, we're coming up to the end. What happened before happens again. And you might as well realize that from the swarming, it basically centers itself still even to this day. And you can hear that trembling and fear to some people and um, certainly is not a peace. We'll blow them out of the water. We'll blow here. We'll blow there. We'll close this. We'll close that. We'll have, uh, and, and so it is. Verse 6, Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child, Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Um, and, and, um, and so it is that men don't have children. They don't have a womb. But what is it talking about? It's talking about the birth of a new age. You're coming right into it, and a lot of people can't recognize that fact. <clears throat> they're preparing themselves for that birth and don't even realize it, the events of the world. 
When you're a watchman, you had better be the well watching. Verse 7, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Uh, <clears throat> it is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And this, of course, has to do with, uh, with Matthew chapter 24 and Mark 13. It's talking about that, that time of trouble when God's elect are delivered up before the false messiah. And all those seven events that are written as seven trumps, seven vials, and seven uh, seals come to pass uh, in that generation. And it is the generation of the fig tree, which from, uh, I hope you have noticed that from Jeremiah chapter 24, which is the prime root of the, the uh, parable of the fig tree, which means the end generation, when you see it, that from that time we have had these prophecies and actual history that pertain to the end. And here we come right down, I mean face to face, with Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, the day of Jacob's trouble. Not a little thing like never before, like even men straining for, for the fact of the birth of a new age. Verse 8, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bounds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. It's the end time. I'm going to take the king of Babylon and I'm going to break everything he has put together and destroy it. I'm going to free my children. That's restoration of the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Both separate, but both restored. Verse 9, But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Who is that? Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Second advent. He's coming back. And he's not coming back to be crucified like a, a born a babe. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. Verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. When you know that God's hand is upon you. Now there is something taking place here that I, I, I warned you to keep the house of Judah and the house of Israel separate. But when Jacob is used to describe them. That's the natural seed. Jacob is the father of all 12 tribes, meaning, and his name being changed to Israel, the prince who prevailed with God. It means I'm going to bring both houses. I'm going to restore all of them, my natural children. And naturally, Back to verse 9, where the Messiah himself appears, all that believe upon him shall inherit that eternal life. We're going to restore things. Do you, do you know what that is? You, know, you understand what we're talking about here? It's the covenant God has made with his children. It's a covenant that you can believe in, that you can claim, that you can live. You don't have to be afraid of anything. Some people, when, when they shake in their boots, is that lack of faith? Well, in a sense. Everyone has, a, uh, uh, has the tendency to be confused at times, but always come back to the reality that God promises, I will protect you. You don't have anything to be afraid of. I'll handle it. Verse 11, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered them, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure 
and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. If God loves you, He's going to thump your gourd occasionally. He's going to chastise you. And do you know something? You got it coming. Why? Because He loves you. He doesn't want you. At that moment you're confused and you get off, He's going to thump your gourd, friend. And when you sin, repent of it. Let Him know you've had a change of heart and a change of mind that you love Him that you want to follow Him, you want to serve Him. Here am I, Lord, use me. Because we're in this time of Jacob's trouble, there will be many delivered up to speak with the Holy Spirit speaking through them, as it is written in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, as I forementioned. We're in that time slot here. And God is saying, hey, what are you worried about? I'm with you. I'm going to save you. And then he says at the same time, uh, you be one of these poor me babies and I'm going to thump your gourd every once in a while. It, um, God is putting together a group and he wants, to, he wants to toughen up and he wants people ready to serve. And so it is that he, so, and so he does. Uh, verse 12, For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous, um, your sin is. Get rid of it. Verse 13, There is none to plead thy cause that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. There's nobody around to heal your wounds. And speaking in a spiritual sense, if you're wounded in these end times, misled, deceived, there's not that many teachers that are really teaching God's Word or there's not that many people to stand there and give you some healing balm that gives you eternal life with Almighty God. A lot of people just put a Band-Aid on it and say, you're not really hurt, just go on into deception and confusion. Um, you don't have anybody to bandage you up or to anoint you with the oil of our people when you get right down to it. Verse 14, all thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not, for I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one for the multitude of thine iniquity because thy sins were increased. Um, and certainly, uh, what he's saying, you bring this on yourself. Well, I'd like to blame it on somebody. No, you can't do that. He, he, did you not understand the very first of this? Jeremiah, institute the book. Write it down. I want all my children to be able to read it with understanding. I want it to be there as a healing bomb. I will never leave them. I will never forsake them. You don't get into the book and um, uh, you, don't, um, you don't help yourself and you bring it down on your own head. You won't repent. You keep sinning. Well, I didn't know I was sinning. Uh, well, uh, I mean, they told me I didn't have anything to worry about. I didn't even have to understand God's Word. I was going to be gone. Well, now who told you that? Did God tell you that or did some man? Now stop and think now before you answer. Because God didn't tell you that because it's not written. If some man told you that, guess what? You're bringing it down on your own head because it's not biblical. God didn't, did he say, Jeremiah, write down these words in this book so that people can ignore them and be ignorant of them? No, he said, write them down so they'll have the truth, so they'll know what's transpiring. So it is true, as this verse, particularly this 14th verse, is you bring it down on your own head. All you had to do all the time is repent, get into the Word of God, find out what the plan of day is, and be a good soldier for the Lord, a good Christian. 15. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. Um, that's, um, uh, 
verse 16, Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all that prey upon thee will I give for prey. If they want to take a prey, I'm going to let them be a prey. That's God's covenant with us. What he's saying, uh, I'm going to thump your gourd when you get out of the way. That's to let you stay out of trouble. That's to help you stay out of trouble. Letting you know that I love you. You know, if a parent loves a child, he's going to chastise that child and correct it so it doesn't get hurt. Well, that's what your father is doing. He wants to correct you so that you're not hurt by the traditions of men and the ways of the world and that you come into true and faithful salvation that God can help you. Uh, these are powerful scriptures in this chapter. It's God, God's assurance of exactly how it's going to be, and I guarantee you that's exactly as it is today. You can help yourself. You can grow close to God. You can pick up the word, all of it, that he has left for you to guide you and direct you, whereby you can prepare yourself to be ready for Matthew 24 and for, for um, Mark 13 and Luke 21. Because why? You have work to do there. Many of you have known since you were a child that you had a destiny that God was touching you. And it is quite simple how that comes to pass, especially in these end times, the days of Jacob's trouble. Jacob being the father of all 12 tribes, that is mean to mean of all the house of Israel and all the house of Judah. And quite frankly, Jacob's day of trouble is also a day for all believers' trouble. God, is it's a good day though, because it means that we're at that time is known as the end. Verse 17, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they call thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. This is the house that God, the house of Jacob, no one seeks them. Well, God does. And, and so it is. This is why you can count on him. Do you understand this is the covenant? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You know, man might put a Band-Aid on it. God heals it. Okay. He heals you. What? He teaches you truth through the word. The very first verses of write this down in a book so they can know. And, and um, it's not just a Band-Aid. It's the healing bomb, which is called the truth, and the truth will set you free. It will set you free from ignorance, from not knowing what tomorrow brings. It will set you free from deception by man and bring you into the full knowledge of the Word of God, whereby you can be a decent person in serving the living God. Verse 18, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, or you look here, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded up upon her heap, own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. Um, this, this would be the millennium, of course. Do you remember when Christ, in Matthew, speaking of Matthew 24 and Mark 13, do you remember what Christ said at the beginning of that chapter? They told him, Master, look at these buildings. And he said, look at them good. Because there is a day coming that there won't be one stone left standing atop another. Now, some uninformed people will tell you this happened by a little Roman general named Titus in 70 A.D., which is a lie because it consummates the end of this age, and 70 A.D. was a long, long time ago. So don't listen to men's traditions that make void the Word of God. No, it will be every stone cast, cleansed, 
and the millennium temple shall transpire. And so it will be that Zion will be the perfect place that will educate. And God is put, why is God calling out his elect to witness against this? That is to say, the evil one. They're teachers. He's going to sit on the right hand of God on the throne until his enemies are made his footstool. He's putting together a group that will place the enemy under his feet. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, that becomes an easy task. If you've read the Word, if you understand the plan of the day, how the operation goes forth, which is called the covenant of the living God. Verse 19, And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Every knee will bow on the first day of the millennium. You know, uh, many people might say, well, he said he was going to be a little rough on us. That he was going to thump some gourds. He's going to chastise some people. Beloved, do you not understand why? You know, as an old combat veteran, I can tell you why. If I'm putting a platoon together that I'm going into combat with, before we ever go, I'm going to break the weak. I'm going to break those that will not discipline themselves that would be a poor me baby. Why? You do not want to get into combat and have a weak one that will run or depart and leave the rest in danger. You want people that believe in what you're doing that are well disciplined and you're one group against Satan and any of his opposition that would come against us. You're not going to put together a group of people that are going to let you down. Do you understand that that's what your father's doing? I mean, he's, he has, you're in this trial period now of traditions of man, deception of the world, or the true word of God. That's why he told Jeremiah, write it down in the book. And when, when men are going around just holding themselves in time for the birth of the age and they don't know here, come here from Sikkim, they didn't read the word. They didn't even try. They didn't have anybody to bandage them up, to heal them, to teach them. That's why God has teachers, so that those that are supposed to hear, those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, will hear that living Word of God. So our Father has every right to chastise you and shape you up. I mean, did He not say, what, what are you worried about? They're going to tell you trouble, war, and everything else. I'm telling you, I will protect you. I'm telling you, I will save you. I'm telling you, I will heal you. Do you believe him? I mean, you can. It's good as gold, my friend. Even better, the word of your heavenly Father, the covenant that he makes with man. Well, he loves his children. But he wants them to be as he would have them, whereby they are a mighty army, no give, no take, the true bomb, and straightforward, knowing that God sees. When He is in the equation of the plan, don't worry, we win. There is no doubt about it, not even a little speck of doubt. We win. Why? Because God is with us. So, in shaping people up, building their strength and faith and knowing He is with you, that He wants to touch you and bring you through the trials and tribulations of this world, whereby you have that perfect example. How He keeps a wall around His children and, and protects them, especially in the great nations, Christian nations of the world, whereby you have that peace and tranquility, but knowing 
on the millennium, every knee is going to bow. Why? Because he has people that are going to instruct. They're going to teach. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, God's elect will reign as priest with him for a thousand years. That's fantastic. That's, that's getting the word out. That's teaching discipline. Verse 20 to continue. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. What have you got to worry about? God is going to take care of us. I know that politically and many other ways, things will come against us. Don't worry. God will take care of it. He uses our knowledge and our wisdom to know how to handle it in a free world. And so far, we are still free in the Americas and most Christian nations. And we are free, and we're not going to let that slip away. Why? Because God is with us. There is, there is, it is no accident that the Christian nations are the superpowers of the end times, that you have decency in those nations, friendship, and a caring world. Well, why is it like that? Because God cares. He is with us. He will protect us. And He will punish those that come against us. I mean, do you think many things that are happening in this world today are an accident? It's no accident. It's the hand of God. And time marches on. And our people and our children are certainly witnesses thereof. Verse 21, And their nobles um, shall be of themselves, and their governors shall proceed from the midst of them, and I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me, for who is this that engaged his heart to, to approach unto me, saith the Lord. And naturally, uh, who, who is it that can approach the Lord? Have you ever read Ezekiel chapter 44? He just identified his elect there, the Zadok. Only they can come to the Lord in the millennium reign, which is what we're, we got into back in chapter, verse 19 and 20 there. Is, he said, my leaders are going to be picked from the Zadok. And there again, I would repeat again, Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. You're going to be a priest. What does a priest do? Teaches discipline. Gets the troops ready. Have brave hearts that march forward, not backwards. And, and march in unison. And are one body, Christ's body, as the end approaches. And we have every victory. Uh, Get your leaders from your own. Do you understand that's what he's saying? Choose your leaders from your own people. Don't put anything over you that isn't of God or a follower of God. 22, and you shall be my people and I will be your God. That's the, this, that's the old book of Hosea, the whole teaching that backs that up. There he says, you are lo ami, and no, you are ami. Lo ami in the Hebrew tongue means you're not my people, but ami means you are my people, and I am your God. I, I don't know, again, I don't like to see people worry when we have promises like this. He's with us. We win. We have nothing to fear, and we have nothing to worry about. I want you to shape up, and I want you to know spiritually that you cannot be weak in this generation. Be strong. Take the balm of the Holy Spirit and strengthen yourself of the, in the assurity that in this book that God ordered Jeremiah to write, that you have that assurance from God Himself. You're His child. He's your Father, period. Verse 23, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall 
fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. Oh, dear goodness. What, are you the wicked? Well, no, of course not. Well, then what are you worried about? You know, can you read? What did it say? You don't have anything to worry about. This, this falls upon the head of the wicked. You're not the wicked. Now, through deception, many people would try to put you into that trip to make you an underling and a wicked one. Sins every day. That's why if Christians repent, it's gone. You're not wicked. The wrath of God falls only on the wicked people. This is why that um, we had that old saying, the proverb, just a chapter or so back, kale uh, kali uh, kalam, meaning the enemy is is cursed and roasted. And that's what happens. That's what the king of Babylon did to some of them. They threw, they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace heated seven times hotter than necessary, even against the will of the king of Babylon. And he got tricked into it. But then the king said, how many people did we put in there? And they said, three. And he said, I see four. And there's one with them that's like the Son of God. And it was the Son of God. They weren't singed. That is to assure you, you couldn't have a better insurance policy than being loved by the living God. Don't be afraid. His anger is at the wicked. He loves you. That's why he corrects you. 24, the furious anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath done it and until he hath performed the intents of his heart, that's his mind, in the latter days. You shall consider it. We're in those latter days, beloved. You had better consider it. How wonderful and how precious it is to know that you are one of his children and he is your God that He protects you, that His wrath does not come upon you, but upon the wicked, the deceivers, and those that would down, be, cause our people to be downtrodden, that He picks us up. When you read the book, you're told, we win. You don't have anything to worry about. Your Father loves you. Repent of all your sins and build a discipline within yourself to trust Him to know Him, and to know you have nothing to fear, but fear itself, because He loves you, and when He is with you, it doesn't matter who's against you. You have the victory. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about some reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. That's, that's our Father's job. And you get into that business and he'll get on your toes right quick. He doesn't like it. He, 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 can, he thinks he can handle that all to himself, and I believe he can. But you do have the right for spiritual discernment to know what you should hear, what you should listen to. I always hope it's the Word of God, because He is your Father. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. 
Got it. <clears throat> and it's always good to hear from you. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number. You don't need an address. God knows what you're thinking. Hey, he's in control. He's on the throne. He's, he, he doesn't take time out. He's full time watching over the children. You don't have anything to worry about. That's, how, that's the kind of father we have. Let him know you love him. Okay? That's, that's what he wants to hear from you. Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you need, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's name. Amen, amen. Okay, and question time. <clears throat> Let's see. You mentioned that in December 2012, Saturn and Satan, Satan's planet would uh, align with Virgo. No, it's been in Virgo for oh, well around a year now, along with Zamak. Not sure of the spelling. Can you please tell me what Zamak means or stands for? Also, can you please explain the significance of this to help me understand it better? Well, <clears throat> it's, it is simply um, movement of the stars. Zamak is, in, is a Hebrew word that means the branch. Who is the branch? It's Christ. Because the sign Virgo in the constellation of Virgo means the virgin. Who is the virgin? Christ's mother. Zamak, the branch, the branch is the branch that we are tied to. In, in, the, in the spiritual world. There is not an alignment of the planets, but uh, uh, on, um, on uh, December of this year, as some are teaching, there is an alignment that centers on the Milky Way, which is a different subject, and I'll be speaking more on that as time grows closer. Margaret from Michigan, please explain Daniel's 70th week. When its future, when its future in the Bible study is say, saying um, it's already happened, they also say when Stephen was stoned, Israel denied the Holy Spirit and committed unpardonable sin. Not true. You got that right. That's so far off. It's ridiculous. I'm 87 years old, and something in me says that they are teaching these their own interpretation saying it's the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid you're right. They're so wrong. I guarantee you that did not come from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit does not lie to people. And certainly there is no indication whatsoever. I've read the Bible in more than one language. And the seventh chapter of Acts, is, which is, concerns the death of Stephen, uh, has nothing to do with uh, the unpardonable sin and that coming to pass. Besides, it would be a little bit ignorant to say Israel stoned uh, Stephen to death. It was the Kenites. Where are, where are they? You know, there is, it, that is, I don't want to call people names, but that's just a little bit on the ignorant side. Uh, Orlando, I started to say Orlando from Florida. I believe it's from Orlando, Florida, and because of that, I'm not going to mention a name, okay? What is the current order of the book of Revelation? I'm 72 years old, and the widow is still learning. Well, the, you have six seals, which is to place knowledge in your mind, and when you understand the six, seven seals all together, then you have seven trumps. Trumps execute the command, means brings the seals to pass. And when we get to the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial, that's 666. Six, six. That's when the Antichrist appears. And then when seven comes, 777, seven, seven, that's when Christ appears. In other words, when the seventh seal, the seventh trump, and the seventh vial happen, Christ returns, as we were reading in today's lecture. Uh, Bobby from Kentucky, my question is, I heard you say on a previous program that the flyaway doctrine started from a man in about 1832. Can you tell me more about that? No, it was a woman, M Margaret MacDonald, and it happened in 1832. We, we have a, um, a book in our library that you can order 
that it's called the Rapture Doctrine, and um, it'll tell it'll teach you more about the Rapture than probably where, how it started that false teaching, because it is false. And um, there happened to be two preachers standing by when this little lady she was had a mental problem. And they heard it and they were, any moment doctrine. Oh, that is fantastic. She also was speaking in the what is called the unknown tongue right after that and started a whole new thing. Uh, and so it is. The book will explain. Uh, Dolores from Missouri, please answer my, my son died at the age of eight years old. When I get to heaven, will, I will he still be eight or will he be 48? That would be his age. We're all the same age in heaven. Age has nothing to do with your spiritual body because we were all created at the same time. And when we have in the eternity, we're all exactly the same age. Why? Are we all the same age? Because we are all created at the same time. That does not change. And time and age has nothing to do on a spiritual body. It is eternal if you have an eternal soul. But you can have an eternal body and have a soul that's liable to die and you're in a heap of hurt. You better get right with God and overcome. Okay, this would be Elaine and Michael from Canada. You know, you two are going to have to decide that. There is, I would simply give you 1 Corinthians chapter, 13, chapter 10, verse 13. Um, but uh, congratulations on the conception. But um, just pray about it and let God lead you. Man can't. God can. God will lead you in it. Okay. This would be um, George from Rhode Island. I've heard you preach that we, if we die, that all of us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we all go to heaven. The other day when you answered the same question, but you said that the unbelievers unrepented do not go to heaven, is this correct or did I misunderstand an answer? Please clear this up uh, for me once and for all. When... Uh, uh, I think probably you, um, you misunderstand. All go to paradise, which is where God is, which you can call it heaven if you want to, but it's paradise, biblically speaking. But as it's written in Luke 16, there is a gulf in the middle of it, and the bad are on this side and the good on this side. And um, what it means is the good, bad, and the ugly all go to paradise. Why? Because that's where God is and He's the judge. Now we have the millennium where those that absolutely did not have an opportunity to learn the truth will be taught. And then at the end of the millennium, the Satan is released a short season. And then maybe some of them will overcome, maybe some won't. But if... Um, the bad do not go to the eternal heaven if they don't, unless they change, okay? But everybody goes to the Father. He's the judge, and, and that's just common sense, okay? It's called paradise. It's the holding place of, of the uh, spiritual bodies. That's where God is. Uh, Tom from North Carolina. I'm a little confused. I want to know whenever we pr whenever we pray, do we use the Father's name or do we use God our Lord? But I know we have to use Jesus' name. Well, you're right there. We, we pray and ask in Jesus' name that gives credentials that we're a Christian. But our, our Father, if you use the sacred name, it would be Yahweh. Okay. If you, um, but you can call him our Father because he is our Father. He's very intelligent, and you don't have to be strict or anything else in talking to him. He hears you. He understands you. You can call him Father, Heavenly Father, my loving Father, Yahweh, the living God, and, but always do ask in, in the name. Don't, don't try to practice some written prayer to our Father. I mean, after all, he's your closest relative. Talk to him. That's all you have to do. Marlene from New York. We have often heard you say that when a Christian dies, they immediately go to heaven in a spiritual body. 
I thought that when Christ returns and resurrects the dead, that is when one gets a new spiritual body, why would one need to be resurrected if they already are in heaven with a spiritual body? This puzzles me. Thank you for your help. Well, I'll be, um, the fact is that resurrection, the word in the Greek, has three meanings. If you return to the spiritual truths, you resurrect to a higher level of thinking. If you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you resurrect to a better position in eternal life. If your body dies, you resurrect. The spiritual body steps out. The flesh body goes back to dirt. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the spirit body returns to the Father. For what? Judgment. Okay. And, and so it is. Uh, but... It, it does not happen. The, those that are already dead, they've already resurrected. This is why, this is why that, um, it is ignorant for people to misunderstand 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When, when you study literature, you must always pick up the subject and the object before you can simply understand it. When you go to verse 13 and 14, it says, if you believe, don't, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen. If you believe Christ rose from the dead, you've got to believe that all those that sleep in Christ have risen also. They've already resurrected. You're behind date if you think it doesn't happen until the seventh trump. At the seventh trump, we who are alive and remain, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in the twinkle of an eye will be changed into spiritual bodies and be with the Lord. But those that have already passed away, they're already out of here. That's biblical, it's solid, and there's no problem with it. Uh, Craigton from uh, Nebraska. My 15-year-old daughter is out of control, does not respect me, and will barely talk to me. Her mother is easy on her regarding discipline, and she says I'm too hard on her. What do I do biblically? I'm so discouraged. Also, I was told we do not have to anoint ourselves since Christ died on the cross. That's not true. James chapter 5 states that when you're ill or when something is wrong, you need to anoint yourself, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, knowing not, a wise person cannot give advice without knowing both sides of a story. Do I, if your wife says you are too hard, are you a military person that practiced too much discipline? Probably not. But at the same time, um, when you're the head of the house, there is a certain amount of discipline that you must gently and firmly never correct a child when you're angry and always explain why you are correcting. <clears throat> when you um, discipline someone, you usually have to take something away that they uh, enjoy for a period of time as a penalty to get attention, to get their attention. So uh, it's, uh, I cannot give you any advice directly because I don't know the whole situation, but uh, that is a terrible thing and... and do give slack where your daughter is 15. She's coming into womanhood and likes to think for themselves. You cut, uh, realize that, and um, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll remember you in prayer. Uh, okay, we got um, Mina, Mini from uh, Oregon. I no longer want to celebrate Passover with Easter eggs or bunny rabbits because of its pagan ritualistic meaning. Question, why, what are some ideas for celebrating Passover with the kids so that they will not miss or, or resent the change? What did you do with your kids? Well, we, we um, taught them the truth of what it was about, and they chose on their own to pull away from it, but yet at the same time to respect the ignorance. You know, when, when somebody doesn't know any better, they don't know any better. So have your, always have your children respect 
others' ignorance. That's not an insult. Ignorance just means that they don't know any better. Okay. But when you do know better, but the fact that you explain what Passover is about, the blood of the Lamb, which is Christ, causes all the evilness to have to pass over us. And the table of the Lord became our Passover, that is to say, Holy Communion. And always have that in your home if you're not near a, a body that you partake of that communion with. Do it yourself in your home. Or do it with us on television. I give uh, at Passover, I will be administering communion, Passover communion. John from California. I am 60 and disabled. I am wondering what kinds of works I should be doing for the Lord. Uh, when, when you're disabled, a, a witness, like if somebody asks for a word of encouragement or something from a disabled person, it comes strong when you're a Christian. Okay? Because they wonder, well, if you're disabled, why didn't Christ heal you? Or why didn't he make you? And you, Because we know things happen. We live in a world that's polluted and things happen. And when they see you as a strong Christian giving that advice or that encouragement, it goes a long way. And when you're delivered up before the false Christ, it, that's the main thing in this generation anyway. Mark chapter 13 gives you that uh, knowledge. Gloria from Colorado. Question, I have been trying to get this question to you for many, so many times. But here it's something if you will, maybe it will be that you will answer it for this for me. Genesis 3.22, who is the Lord talking to at this point? Um, he, is, he is talking uh, to man, Adam, saying um, because man has partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and knows what good and evil is because Satan had seduced them, then we're going to drive him from the garden before they partake of the tree of life. Who is the tree of life? That's Christ. Well, Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. So that could not partake or happen until after the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. Then you can partake of the tree of the knowledge, the, the, the tree of life. Which means what? When you partake of the tree of life, and then you become an eternal plant yourself. We are considered the trees of God's planting, and so you are. Uh, Victoria from Louisiana. How can I be deceived in the last days by the Antichrist? Is it just trusting the word or more? How can I not be deceived? Well, um, if, if you um, are familiar with the fact that it's Satan, you're not going to be deceived by him. You hate him. You, you, you consider him not tempting, but he's an abomination. And God himself wants to speak through you when you're delivered up. So it's out of the question for you to be deceived when you know who the first, you know the Antichrist comes first before the true Christ. So stand against him. Do not be deceived. What is a watchman? A watchman is one that reads God's word and watches current events and biblical prophecy to know the time. I use a Nelson study Bible. Is it okay? It's okay if you're happy with it. That's great. Uh, uh, Phyllis from Florida, I really like the tongue lashing Paul administered to uh, Ananias in Acts 23.3. What did Paul mean by thou whited wall exactly? Well, he was cutting him down real good. He said, don't you talk, don't you call that me, that you whited wall. A, a whited wall is somebody that claims to be real strong, but they're whitewashed. And have you ever happen, watched what happens to whitewash outside in a hard rain? Down it goes and into the gutter and washes away. It means he's a fake, okay? He was appointed by, by a Roman governor, not God. 
That's to say the, the false priest. Um, Nanny from Ohio, I have a question. I am thinking of donating my body to the medical school for study. First, my body may help them to learn something to help someone else. <clears throat> and next, I can't afford the expense of a burial casket. <clears throat> and excuse me, and all that, and I don't want to be a burden or expense to anyone else. Please give me your opinion. If you feel led to do that, that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Your, your spiritual body has already stepped out and you're with the Father anyway. So uh, the flesh body goes back to dust and you don't need it anymore anyway. It, it, is, it is an honorable thing to do, I feel, and uh, that would certainly be up to you. Don't, don't let anyone put you on a guilt trip over it. Uh, Brayman from Kentucky. Can you please give me an accurate description of blasphemy? Can you also please give me the different definitions of hell when it is used in the Bible? Well, okay, um, let's, let's take the blasphemy. You can find really in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, it's for one of God's elect to not allow the Holy Spirit to. I'm going to hold your question over because I am out of time. And it's going to take a little longer. I'm, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, but most of all, God loves you for it. It makes His day. It's the book He had written for you. And when you study it, it does. It makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.